The goal of this e-lecture is to introduce you to the sound system of Old English. You might ask, how can we set up a sound system of a language where we have no audio recordings, let alone native speakers? Well, the details of the sound system of an extinct language are normally inferred from the written remains and, if they don't exist either, the principles of comparative phonology are applied sound shifts, losses and so on. In the case of Old English we have written records, especially from the later history. But even with these we can only arrive at an approximation and have to set up a sound system where no auditory verification is possible. Nevertheless we will try. And even more so I will produce the sounds of Old English. So, let's start. This is what we will be doing. First, we will define a reference variety of Old English. Then, we will look at the Old English phonemes in detail. We will take a look at the orthography of Old English and will finally try and exemplify the sounds of Old English on the basis of a written text. So, let's start. Now, surviving texts from the Old English period occur in four main varieties West Saxon, Kentish, Mercian, and Northumbrian. Towards the end of the Old English period, the West Saxon kingdom, Wessex, became dominant and the West Saxon variety became the literary standard. Thus, most scholars treat West Saxon as the leading variety of Old English. Today, the following classes of phonemes are assumed for the West Saxon variety of Old English. We have 15 monophthongs that can be subdivided into seven long ones and seven short ones and one central monophthong. We have four diphthongal phonemes and we have 17 consonantal phonemes. The consonantal phonemes had much the same value as they have in present day English, but they have a different distribution. The vowels by contrast differed considerably from their modern counterparts. So let's look at all phonemes in detail and let's start with the monophthongs here first of all with the long monophthongs we already said there were seven long monophthongs in Old English so let's look at them in detail here is the first one tide the e as in tide present-day English this is of course tide then we have an e as in grene present-day English green. Old English had an a as in dal, present-day English deal. There was a low back vowel a as in got, present-day English goat. A mid-high back vowel o as in foda, present-day English food and a high back vowel u as in hus present day english this is of course house and then a vowel which did not exist or does not exist in present day english any longer the rounded high front vowel u as in mus present day english mice as you can see orthographically these long monophthongs were all indicated by means of a macron on top of the vowel. So this is the indication of vowel length in orthography. The pattern of the long monophthongs in Old English is a highly congruent pattern. Let us now add the short monophthongs. And as I already said, 
there are seven short monophthongs too. So here they are. Each long monophthong had a short counterpart. The representation is overlapping because we cannot put them in the same position on a chart like that. Here is the first one. Kissen, a short E, a high front vowel, as in the present-day English verb to kiss. A short A, which is slightly lower than the high one, bed, a mid-high front vowel, which is approaching the mid position, and a low front vowel, a short vowel, a, as in that, present day English, this is that. And then a low back vowel, here it is, makian, present day English, make. Here is the counterpart of the long mid high back vowel, o, as in hopian, short o. This is the short U, a high back vowel, full, present day English, full of course. And here is the equivalent of the front, rounded front vowel, fillin, as in present day English, fill. And last but not least, there was one central vowel, namely the schwa. Sorry, I had to switch off this one. This is the one in Jelive which means present day English believe. So in unstressed position we have this short central vowel. So the whole monophthongal system was a relatively congruent pattern. Each front vowel had a back vowel counterpart however the quality of the mid-high front vowel e eh, was a bit lower than that of its back vowel counterpart. The most important difference as compared with present-day English was the availability of rounded front vowels, long U and short U, like in German, for example. Like present-day English, Old English also had the central vowel schwa, which occurred in most unstressed syllables, for example, in the prefix je, or in suffixes, for example, de. Let's continue with the four diphthongs in Old English. Now, the diphthongs in Old English occurred in two pairs, long and short. They were all centering, that is their second vocalic element was the central vowel schwa. This movement towards the central target can also be referred to as ingliding. So all Old English diphthongs were ingliding diphthongs. Here they are. Let's start with the short ones. The first one is er, as in herte, present day English heart. And the second one is a little bit has a lower onset. It is er, as in erle, which means present day English all. And the two long ones. Here is the first long one. Er, bear which means present day English beer and the second one is air which occurs in the word sharp present day English sheep a relatively straightforward diphthongal system here are the 17 consonants and again I want to stress that they are consonantal phonemes. Old English retained all consonants of common Germanic although the distribution of some of them had been affected by some sound changes. So let us compare the consonantal system with that of present-day English and let's first of all look at the inventory. Now there were some strange or amazing inventorial differences for example, the ch, the first one here, as in licht, and the ch, as in fucht, were part of the sound inventory. However, as you can see here, they were allophones of the phoneme h, that is the glottal fricative. Similarly, the R 
as in Aran was a special allophone of G. So this is an inventorial difference, however, on an allophonic level. Now, secondly, we have distributional differences. And this is quite interesting. The voice fricatives V as in driven, V as in Bavian, or Z as in reason, they were only used in voiced contexts. Elsewhere, for example, word initially, their voiceless counterparts are used. So let's look at them in detail. So here is the dental the labiodental fricative phoneme with two allophones, the v in voiced environments and the voiceless allophone elsewhere. And similarly we have the dental fricative phoneme again with the voiced allophone in voiced contexts and the voiceless one elsewhere. Badian versus Thunor. And likewise the alveolar fricative, voiceless sonar, and voiced in a voiced environment, reason. Thus we can establish the following rule, a, well let's call it fricative rule for Old English. Whenever we have one of these fricatives, labiodental, dental, or alveolar, we have two allophones. One allophone occurs in a voiced environment and it is voiced v, th, and z and the second one occurs in voiceless uh, environments. Finally we have some special sounds in Old English and these of course concern the pronunciation of the R. Now one thing is assumed for Old English and that is a high degree of roticity which means that the R was pronounced in all contexts even after vowels and secondly it is hard to say what type of R was used was it the alveolar trill as in driven was it the alveolar approximant as in driven or the alveolar flap as in driven well, it is hard to say. Thus, it's up to you which one you use. I normally use the alveolar trill as the primary allophone of the R, but we could say that the allophones of R are in free variation. Further differences between present-day English and Old English concern the use of the vela nasal and the allophonic realization of K. Well, having talked about the phonemic system, let's now talk about the orthography of Old English. The Anglo-Saxons first used a runic alphabet. Now, this alphabet was called Fudak after the initial letters of the symbols that had all names. And so here we have the Feo, the Ur, the Thorn, the Os, the Ar and the Ken. And so if you combine these letters, the initial letters primarily, then you get Fudark. Now each rune was a letter in the alphabet and it also stood for a word. The earliest use of runes, and this is just an excerpt, was for magical purposes. There were many different Fudarks. The fragment used here is an older Germanic Fudark. Later, Irish monks brought the Latin alphabet to England and some new letters with it. And the Old English writing system was based from now on on a modified Latin alphabet. Now here are some symbols that were used in Old English but are no longer used in present day English. I just mark some significant ones. This one, for example, is the so-called ash. You know that from the phonetic alphabet. And then of course we have here the macrons as length marks 
on top of the vowels. Quite interesting is this one here we have representations of the dental fricative, the ev, the second one is the so-called ev, and the first one is a capitalization of a character which is represented normally over here and that is the character thorn used for dental fricatives. Let's finally exemplify Old English and read a textual excerpt. Now here I have a little book which is entitled Old English Literature and it was published by Randolph Quirk, Valerie Adams and Derek Davy a long time ago but these texts obviously don't change anymore. And I will read a little passage from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle which was published or which was written in 991 as a short excerpt of the famous Battle of Malden. So, here it is. Se flod ut jevat, tha flotan stoden jerove, vikinga fella, vijes jerne, het tha halada, chlea, heldan tha britje, wien wi hertne, sewes haten wolfstan, kavne mit his kunne, that was kerl on sunu, se thone forman man, mit his franken of shert. Fer baldly cost on tha britche stop. Fer stood on mit wolfstane, wien un forchte, alvere and makus, modie tween. Tha nolden at tham forda flam je wirken, Aki fast liedje with tha fund werden, tha huile the he wapna welden mosten. This may suffice as an impression of Old English. Now, let us summarize. The Old English sound system is still very much Germanic in character and much closer to German than to present-day English. The 15 monothongs, the 4 diphthongs and the 17 consonants constitute the heart of the Old English sound system. In this e-lecture, e please consider it only as an attempt, I try to do my very best to pronounce all these phonemes with their allophonic realizations and I hope the last passage of the Battle of Malden gave you some impression about what Old English could have sounded like. Thanks for your attention.